very exciting for me to be here in, uh, in Barcelona um, at this wonderful conference. I was just born up the road in the Villas de Mar, so it's my first time back since I was a very uh, young child. Um, but I did grow up um, very far from here on the opposite side of the world in, uh, in New Zealand. And it was in New Zealand where I first uh, developed an interest in uh, open source, open knowledge, and what we're talking about today, um, open design. And uh, it was when I was um, living in a big house called The Big House. Um, this is a huge 21-bedroom, 21-person shared house in Auckland, New Zealand. And um, while I was living here, I, um, I mean, it might seem like a pretty deep level of hell to be living with 20 other people, but it was actually a very enjoyable experience, primarily because we had the systems and uh, rules and organization in place to ensure very fair and transparent decision making, to um, allow for um, everybody to get involved, everyone had a relatively equal footing. And this was all developed over 30 years of consensus decision making and paper-based record keeping. Um, but uh, I did notice it was a relatively egalitarian society, but I did notice one small um, kind of hierarchy evolving and that seemed to be a hierarchy of information. People who had been there for 10 years, five years, they had more say, they knew more about how things worked than people who had only been there for one or two years. So my flatmates and I, a couple of flatmates, got together and we made a little internal wiki for the house. So this was a place where we could share the finances, we could uh, look into the history of the house, collate information, and share recipes. And I certainly didn't realize it then, but this little micro Wikipedia for an audience of 21 was my first few steps into the world of, uh, of open source, of uh, the digital commons, and open knowledge. Um, and this slowly developed into um, an interest and then an obsession as I uh, read more and more um, uh, information on this um, uh, issue. So um, uh, following blogs, watching documentaries, um, uh, following a lot of the conversation going on online. And I was getting into all sorts of different um, uh, areas that nowadays we kind of, we've discussed almost all of these um, uh, in the last couple of days. And although these aren't exactly the same, they do share a common kind of gist, the idea that anyone is free to use or reproduce this work for any purpose. It is a lot more complicated than that, but you've already heard Massimo's wonderful presentation this morning, so I don't need to go into it. I'll share myself a licensing discussion by just adding a little asterisk. But it seemed to me that the discussion going on um, seemed to be quite a technical one uh, with a lot of kind of lawyers and hackers and engineers, people with a lot of deep technical knowledge. Um, and I didn't feel like I could really take, place, take, take part in that. A lot of the talk was about the democratization of production and manufacture and so on, but I felt that this was kind of something above my head. I mean, uh, I didn't know how to code, I couldn't solder. Um, I, I had studied history and um, I worked, I had a, a job editing reality television and making music videos and things. I didn't feel like open hardware really needed a, uh, a guitar solo montage. Um, so I didn't really know how I could help out. But then I realized that maybe perhaps my lack of knowledge, my lack of technical um, background and my lack of practical experience could be an asset in, this, uh, in a certain way. Perhaps I could be a test subject to see just how true this democratization uh, idea was, just how uh, accessible many of these um, uh, ways of working were to new people, to people without technical backgrounds. And so I decided to uh, launch a year of open source. So I started um, on August 1st uh, last year. Um, I uh, created a crowdfunding campaign to get me started. Um, and then uh, on August 1st, I decided to try and live as open source as possible and try and document some of the process, share some of my experiences, and uh, try out a lot of the different ideas along the way. So it's a slow and gradual process, not buying any more um, uh, patented or traditionally copyrighted goods, and trying to search out or switch to or develop open source alternatives. Um, there were a few changes that could take place in the very first day, however, um, the more digital um, uh, side of things. Of course, switching to free software was an obvious one, um, so saying goodbye to uh, Mac, which I'd used all my life, and going to Linux and a uh, new video editor. And this was a slight learning curve, but it was much smoother than I expected, and it's definitely something that is going to stay with me for life. I'm never, never going back. But there were a, sl a few slightly more painful um, goodbyes as well. Having to leave my, my digital um, uh, uh, music and um, film library was pretty difficult. Basically, I had a broad library of music 
spread over all the decades from the 1920s up until the present day. And on the 1st of August, I shut away all of the All Rights Reserve music onto a hard drive to not touch for a year. And uh, this gouged out the majority of my music. I had a few public domain blues tracks from the 20s, and then a handful of Creative Commons liberal licensed work uh, from the last couple of years. And I realized that this maybe perhaps, I mean, this wasn't really uh, a great step forward. This wasn't perhaps the best advertisement for switching to open source. I soon realized, though, that um, these had a different value from normal music tracks. Yes, perhaps my music uh, library wasn't so broad, but I could do a lot more with this free culture music than I could with my old music. This I had permission to use however I liked. And if I wanted to show that value, I had to actually actively use it. And so in all my videos since then, I've been using Creative Commons music, changing it, remixing it, adding it into videos, and publishing those videos under the same attribution share alike license for anybody to use. Um, this kind of became a, a bit of a mantra for me over the, the course of my, uh, my project as well. The idea that I shouldn't just consume goods as you would proprietary goods, but try and show the value of them being open source, try to build on them, try to use other people's work and create new works on top of them. Another thing that I was trying to focus on was um, a local uh, focus. I'm based in Berlin, and um, well, for, for budgetary reasons, I basically had to be based, uh, uh, focused on Berlin as well. But I found that having a local focus was also a good way to show the community aspect of um, a, a lot of these different projects, these different people. Um, and so, for example, when looking at open education, I didn't fly to MIT to ask them about open courseware or interview the Khan Academy guy. I found a couple of local people in Berlin, a group of volunteers, programmers mostly, who were running an organization called Open Tech School. Now, as I said, I couldn't program, so I thought this was a great opportunity for me to try out the open education um, idea. I tried um, MOOCs, I tried online courses, textbooks, um, video courses, uh, but the only method that I truly stuck with was Open Tech School. These guys are focused on uh, uh, creating more diversity within programming. They uh, create Libra licensed, um, uh, so a Commons curriculum that anybody can access and prove it's all on GitHub. And um, they provide these free workshops with volunteers with experience in these areas, helping out newbies as they learn at their own pace. And by increasing diversity, I don't just mean 50% women uh, population. They're based in the Turkish area of Berlin, so that means they offer courses in English, German, and also Turkish as well. Um, but uh, the, the digital side of things and the education side of things, while very interesting, it's not something that really kind of grabs people's attention. I think for me, the real breakthrough when I started looking into this area was, was learning about um, uh, hardware, open source hardware, um, digital manufacturing and so on. So I wanted to also um, try and grab other people's attention by talking about digital manufacturing and 3D printing. Everyone, of course, has been watching the news and seeing all of the hype about um, printing out kind of jetpacks and breast implants and kittens and all sorts of things. Um, we're going to all be printing arsenals of guns in the next couple of years. Um, so I thought maybe this was an opportunity for me to just print myself a new lifestyle. Uh, so I went on Thingiverse and went looking for useful objects that I needed uh, that I could um, print out. The search for useful objects, however, was a little trickier than uh, I imagined. There was a lot of interesting objects, a lot of curious trinkets, but not necessarily things I desperately needed for my lifestyle. So I thought I'll leave 3D printing until I actually do need it for something rather than just showing it as a gimmick. I decided to focus first on um, the very first digital manufacturing or domestic digital manufacturing machine, um, which is the, uh, the knitting machine. These machines were made from basically the 1950s up until the 1990s and were spread around many uh, homes and um, kind of home factories. And they take a um, digital image, whether that is from a punch card or from a floppy disk, and they can knit that out into a piece of knitted fabric. Um, and what I really liked about these machines, what I found really interesting, was these were proprietary machines uh, which are that now basically obsolete. Well, from the 1990s until 2010, they were completely obsolete unless you had the old 80s floppy disks. But they've basically been brought back through open source, uh, through open source hacks. 
Um, and what I liked about the story of the resurrection of these machines was it wasn't just one genius tinkering away in a shed who created all of this. It was many different people tinkering away in many different open, uh, uh, internet connected sheds. So Steve Conklin uh, created a script that emulated a floppy drive. Becky Stern and Lady Ada added a hardware link. Fabian Sadia and Travis Goodspeed reverse engineered the keypad. And Barbara Gulyayeva and Mark Annette, um, managed to speed up the whole process. There have been various other people involved as well, adding suggestions, adding code. But you really kind of see each one is building on the other's work, and they're making something useful for them and putting their own work into the commons for everyone else to use. Nowadays, there's also a couple of different software programs built for these machines as well. Nittington's a graphic user interface, and Nittic is Barbara and Mars uh, project to use an Arduino, which you've just been learning about, um, as the brains for, um, uh, for knitting machines. Um, and I was really inspired by this, uh, this story, and I came across um, Fabienne, who happens to live in, uh, in Berlin. So I went to visit her and filmed an um, interview with her about her work, about some of the um, uh, possibilities of these knitting machines. And uh, I wanted to, like her, build on the work of other people to create my own, uh, my own work as well, to see if this was possible for someone without experience to get into too. And uh, I thought a good way to show the vast resources in the commons was to use the public domain. Um, basically everything up until about, well, a hundred years or so ago, it depends on, on different countries, is already available for all of you to use for whatever purpose you like. It's a huge wealth of our cultural history available. So I went on Public Domain Review. This is an Open Knowledge Foundation website which presents interesting things from the public domain, definitely worthwhile checking out. I found these uh, beautiful snowflake images from 1855. Downloaded them, took them into uh, GIMP, used a template from Fabienne uh, who had made um, an open source hat. And the, the winter in Berlin um, was the longest and darkest winter uh, in, uh, since records began. So I definitely needed a nice warm hat for the winter. So we knitted that into this uh, hat right here. And also, it's, um, because you can knit anything you want with a knitting machine, it's reversible. And there's a QR code, so you can basically scan it in and go to the source files of the hat, see the video of it being made, and everything like that. Um, and while thinking about clothing, I thought this was also an interesting area to look into for digital manufacturing. Um, First of all, there's no copyright reason that kind of holds back open source fashion. Um, basically, copying is rife throughout the fashion world. Um, <clears throat> you've got um, the high streets copying the haute couture and everything like that. It all goes on without too many uh, lawsuits. Copyright is not really an issue. But uh, in terms of manufacturing, you can't really 3D print uh, underwear. And underwear was a pressing need that I was, uh, I was feeling. Well, you can if you like the idea of nylon chain, uh, chain mail, but I don't know if you, you might get a little sweaty and itchy in those. Um, so I wanted to find another way to use technology to allow me to manufacture my own underwear and also be able to share them with other people. Um, and I soon realized that uh, if I was to make underwear, well, there was no 3D printer, so I was going to have to learn to sew. So I went down to uh, my local co-sewing space. So this is one of these great maker spaces turning up all over the world nowadays for specific reasons. This one uh, is called Nadelwald in Berlin, and um, they hold workshops and teach people how to sew. This is Fancher Vent. She's a wonderful tailor and designer who uh, taught me all I needed to know about pattern design, how to copy other patterns, and also how to sew. But I realized that if I was going to make my own design and share that with the world, then Basically, people would still have to adjust it to their own shapes. Um, it would only really benefit people who were the exact same size as me. I could provide small, medium, and large, but humans come in more than three sizes. So I thought, maybe I need parametric underwear. I need a way to adjust these underwear specifically for um, uh, individual people. Um, I couldn't do this alone, so I had a lot of help from Svantia in um, working out how to uh, adapt patterns to different sizes. Um, I also had a lot of help from a friend, a maths genius, who basically, when I was stuck, not knowing what to do, he uh, saved me with algebra. If you've ever wondered what the practical purpose of algebra is, it is for creating parametric underpants. Um, and uh, we managed to create, I managed to create a 
um, template using the Magic Box um, uh, online parametric design software. Can we please play the first video? So you can just see it being um, adjusted here. You put in your waist measurements, and it will um, adjust um, different sizes. And then you can print it out as six different um, A3 pieces of paper. So it's a relatively simple um, concept. It's not a particularly complicated template, but it's just to express the idea. Um, and so I managed to print out a few different versions of that and made um, uh, some underwear, not just for me, but for a couple of friends as well. Um, and uh, this is still in, you can actually see a pair of them I've got with me. There you go, not lying. Um, this is an as yet unpublished project, basically because um, the Magic Box uh, software, unfortunately, is an abandoned, poorly documented project, which is an ongoing problem with a lot of different open source projects in various areas. But I went. Uh, uh, back, sorry? Uh, I went back to um, Open Tech School, and they were able to um, uh, help me out, explain how to develop it in processing, and um, so now it's being redeveloped and will be published very soon. Um, so that is the democratization of manufacturing, which I've started dealing with. I have started 3D printing and will be CNC milling this week as well. Uh, but I wanted to look into the idea of the democratization of design as well, having read about the idea of the, the user as designer or as co-designer. I thought uh, this would be a, a good opportunity to try it out. So I thought I would start with the, um, the ultimate kind of designer's uh, obsession, the chair. But there's quite a lot standing between me and uh, me making my own, uh, my own furniture, my own chairs. Um, oh, that's me making that. So I'm a non-designer. I don't have any experience in this. What are the things that are going to be in the way of me actually going from zero to making my own chair? The first one might not be an obvious uh, uh, issue, but it certainly is a big one, IKEA. Uh, it's very difficult to argue with the relatively decent value, uh, value and uh, quality of, of IKEA. It's absolutely everywhere. Everyone has it, and it looks relatively OK. So basically, that's the first hurdle, me actually thinking, yes, I want to go and put in the effort and the hours to make a chair when I can just go and buy one from IKEA. The next is, of course, lack of design history and theory. The results of 10,000 years of people uh, uh, discussing and arguing about chairs and developing different designs is all around me, but it's kind of like seeing a mathematical solution without seeing the working. I don't really know how we got there or, or why. Um, another is the general lack of ideas. I'm not a chair designer. Maybe some of you are. We've got a few designers here. Maybe you think about chairs all the time when you're staring up at the, the clouds. You see a chaise lounge floating around and constantly coming up with ideas for different leg shapes and back arches. But I really only think about chairs when I'm sitting on a particularly uncomfortable one. So I have no ideas for chairs sitting around in my mind. You've got a bit of a head start on me. Another issue is the inability to express the ideas. I'm not a talented draftsman. Um, and computer CAD programs are generally uh, often expensive and uh, usually relatively complicated to get started with. Um, and then there's the lack of understanding of material and technique, um, both the not knowing how to put various pieces together, not knowing um, what kind of file formats uh, people use, not knowing anything about the process involved. So I was very thankful to come across a project called SketchChair. Um, this is a um, design tool um, which is made by a diatom studio. Can we please play the uh, second video? So I'll let Greg sketch explain it. Sketch are designed using a simple sketch-based interface that then generates the chairs and allows you to virtually sit in them, testing their stability to see if they're going to fall over, if they're going to break, and also to make sure that the chair fits your proportions. So it's just the right size for you. So it's a very simple idea, but it's a very good one for people like me who have no idea how to get started designing. By basically limiting the options available to me, it gives me a, it gives me a little playground to play in, basically, a set of rules to uh, abide by. And so with a couple of days of fiddling around and kind of throwing out lots of dreadful ideas and doing a lot of control Z, I eventually managed to come up with a, a design that I liked. Um, but it is a, um, 
it's still a relatively complicated process. This doesn't solve all problems, but what I find exciting about SketchChair is just that it works right now. You can download its free, its free software and you can get playing with it and you can basically spit out a design um, in the correct format for a CNC machine to, uh, to mill after that. So it kind of gets rid of this uh, lack of understanding of material and technique problem simply by removing the options for me. It has to be something flat, something CNC-able, uh, and it decides what kind of joints to make and how to put them together. It only offers one way of putting things together. Um, and it uh, gets around my inability to express ideas. I can basically go through trial and error and just delete anything that doesn't work. Um, it doesn't entirely get through the lack of ideas issue, but uh, many of these kind of um, design tools that you're seeing now do have repositories, libraries, um, and other ways for critiquing, discussing, and improving um, designs. So there's a lot of opportunity for, um, uh, for this whole process to be uh, improved. You've still got to contend with IKEA, of course, but a lot of the problems are starting to be solved. SketchTip does seem to be unique in um, kind of filling this particular niche where it's very easy for uh, newbies to get started, but I see the potential for many more, um, uh, many more similar programs uh, uh, or just ways of simplifying things um, for beginners, as well as having more complicated options for the more professional users. Um, so, uh, a question that I've often received, especially now getting to the end of my, um, my project, is how open source is my life? Um, and to be honest, in a, um, in a relative way, yes, it's more open source than most people, absolutely, but in a uh, absolute way, I've really only started scratching the surface. The whole process takes a lot longer than I imagined. I basically had to learn the simple ideas of collaboration with others and um, uh, how to properly document things. Um, and so it's been a much slower process than I imagined. A lot more complicated too. There were kind of simple questions like how to make an open source phone call that I thought would be relatively quickly solved. Well, you buy an open hardware phone like the Open Phoenix, and then you can make phone calls, right? That's an open source phone call. Um, well, the first problem is that the phone that I uh, got eight months ago has been a huge time hole of learning about uh, how the software works, trying to fix hardware problems, uh, refixing hardware problems, and after eight months, I still have not made a phone call with this, uh, with this device. Um, buy a fair phone. <laughs> but the, um, uh, the question itself, or the answer to the question, is a lot more complicated than it might initially seem. There are a lot of different layers involved in making an open source phone call. It's not just about buying a device. There are, there are levels on, in terms of the networks, in terms of the services required. There are software uh, levels involved. It's a very complicated process, and you can't just solve this by um, going out and buying a phone. So I've realized the process is going to take a lot longer than I initially thought. And so although on August the 1st, when the project officially comes to an end, Yes, I will be going straight to the movies, um, uh, because I haven't seen any films for, for the last year, I haven't been to the movies, but uh, I'm going to be continuing the process um, and continuing these videos and these uh, little projects to try and explain or try and try out a lot of the open source concepts. Um, and the reason for this is just because I feel it's particularly important that the idea is spread into other areas than it already exists in, and that it is promoted in uh, other areas as well that it brings people in with different backgrounds. Um, as I said, I, I, never really think about, um, I never really think about chair design, but as a videographer, I'm thinking all the time about moving images, about film production, um, uh, and uh, the different problems that I have in my day-to-day -day life. And having been through the process of uh, developing things collaboratively, using open source tools and techniques, you start getting ideas for how to fix the problems in your own particular situation using these techniques. So I've had discussions with people, I've started uh, um, developing ideas for uh, uh, collaborative script writing, for um, there are people working on collaborative um, post-production, um, uh, open hardware tools such as wireless microphone systems like I've got on now, camera sliders, all these kind of ideas they generally can't be, these problems can't necessarily be solved by uh, the lawyers or engineers or hackers that I thought were kind of running the open source world um, before I got started. These kind of problems um, that 
uh, filmmakers and videographers have, they can really only be solved by filmmakers and videographers, maybe with a lot of help, but uh, they need that expertise to get them started. And so I kind of feel that the, the, the future does seem like it is moving towards um, maybe not open source everything or a kind of a fully open source ecosystem. But so far I haven't really found many areas where the idea couldn't work. There are areas where it hasn't made much impact yet. Um, the film industry, for example, it is, despite being one of the most collaborative ways of uh, working, huge teams working towards one particular goal, it's also one of the most hierarchical uh, structures. It's a very kind of militaristic kind of uh, uh, army-like structure. And so there's a huge amount of opportunity for uh, improvements using open source techniques. Um, and uh, so I really feel like it's um, a very important next step for us uh, to not only look at how far we've gone in the open knowledge and open design area, but also find ways of bringing new people in. Um, if you are working in this area, do try and reach out to people, do try and document things to uh, make it easier for other people to jump in, make it easier and clearer for people to understand. And if you're not part of this, well, what's stopping you? Thank you very much. What was the the most difficult challenge? What was the thing that made you think, oh, I'm just, I'm going to give this up, it's too hard? There weren't many things that were particularly difficult. Um, the, the things that were the most unpleasant were just uh, not having the mu music and movies that I used to have, because I really discovered that the, the copyright issue that I started with, that wasn't a particularly big issue as I, as I thought. I thought that was the thing really holding back open source, but really with issues like clothing, there isn't there isn't a copyright problem there. Um, and generally there are public domain or non-patented items that will kind of um, uh, solve most problems um, for you using existing traditional techniques, but they don't really show the exciting kind of new world um, of, uh, of open source. And so, um, yeah, I wouldn't really say that there was anything particularly difficult. There were certainly a lot of things that were surprising and that was uh, definitely one of them disco discovering that Copyrights and patents um, are in certain areas very restrictive and, and um, uh, they're a big part of the discussion, but they're not so important in other areas. There are other reasons for open source not being prevalent in other areas. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm glad to hear uh, you're starting an open source life rather than a year. Um, I was particularly interested in your remark where you talked talked about your experience and desires as a filmmaker and how you think filmmakers or video makers need to solve uh, their own particular problems they have. Um, can you uh, tell us maybe something about the kind of ideas you have, how this could work, how you as a practitioner mm -hmm. with a very particular experience could somehow engage with that kind of development? The, there are some issues which are purely technical um, that are holding back any kind of open source filmmaking and that is things like the, the large file sizes involved um, where people are, um, uh, if people are trying to edit um, footage in different parts of the world together that means you need to have this these huge files online and you need a huge amount of processing power to actually edit them together. So that's a problem that is basically slowly being solved by uh, uh, as technology improves. And there are people working, people like uh, Novacut for example is an interesting uh, free software project which is really just starting out but they're trying to solve that particular um, uh, issue. Another thing is that people have tended to, uh, within filmmaking, um, tried to start something that's kind of uh, saying that things are uh, an open source film because I've put my footage online and you're free to, to edit it and do with it what you like. Um, but generally if you have put all of your raw footage on, online, um, it's generally compressed too much to be particularly useful for anybody. Um, and also it's a huge amount of work in terms of uh, editing a film. Nobody's going to take all of this footage that you've shot and edit it into uh, a new film in most situations. Um, so the, the most kind of interesting areas that people are working on in you know, trying to create an open source film are the, the Blender movies. They're not necessarily the best uh, storylines, these movies, but they do have the great, um, uh, a great idea and then they give out all of their um, 3D um, designs. These are entirely 3D rendered films made with Blender and they make all of their assets, so all the background objects, the characters, the um, uh, props and things, they're all available for other people to use. So if there can be a bit of a community started 
based around uh, based around those, then there's a um, uh, an opportunity for a bit of a community to grow. Um, other areas, like I mentioned, the the wireless microphone system. This kind of thing costs, uh, the cheapest is about 600 euros or something, and they're generally made for this kind of conference situation or for a large um, uh, television crew or a film set. Um, but there are a lot of people, especially nowadays, running around with DSLR cameras like mine or working um, uh, by themselves, and they don't have the same needs as a, a film crew. They don't have quite the same uh, requirements, and they can make do with a smaller, simpler, uh, uh, cheaper option, but there is no cheaper option at the moment. So that's an opportunity to use the open hardware that exists right now, people creating, for example, there's a miniature um, uh, radio, radio frequency based uh, miniature Arduino kind of um, uh, device, and there's um, Rockbox um, uh, MP3 player software that can record uh, good quality audio. The idea is that you can basically take a lot of these components, put them together, and fiddle around with it. And that's the kind of thing that I feel confident that I can basically try, not because I have the technical experience um, uh, in how microphone systems work or anything like that, but simply because it's easy to try. It only costs 25 euros or something for the little parts, and it just costs my time to play around with it and get a better understanding of it. And it means that I don't have to lay out a huge amount of investment saying I'm starting a company to make microphone systems you're free to basically, to basically play around and see how it goes. You don't necessarily have to make any commitments to, uh, to it as you would in a proprietary situation. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, small situations like that. Any other questions? Hi, Sam. Hi. Um, I'm an engineer. I understand open sources, CAD and schematics and source code and all that, but you said you had to rule out a lot of your music, um, and that's... Uh, not so much source, like the, the musical scores and all that as I interpret it. So I wonder if you could say how far is this the open source life? Is it you're excluding things which are copyrighted as well? Is it things uh, have to be free? Sort of how broad is it? Sorry, the you were saying about the sorry. Source? Can you hear me? Am I talking? not quite clear? Sorry, I understand open source as being uh, the source files, you know, mm. how it was created, so the musical score or the schematic or the source code. But you, has, you said you had to throw away a large amount of your music. Oh, right. But that's not necessarily that you didn't have access to musical scores. So I wondered if you could explain your open source life. How, yeah. What is it? Is it copyright? Does it have to be free? Or how broad is it? Basically, it's, it's, uh, a lot more, it's, it's a lot more broad than just the word um, open source, definitely, because the, I'm more interested in how this process is working in all of these different areas. And as Peter mentioned in his talk yesterday, the, you can't just take the ideas of free software and slap them onto other areas without making some modifications. And so I was interested in the, the free culture um, uh, kind of uh, subject, which is, as you say, you're not looking for the source files necessarily. Um, it's difficult to go and find um, people who are putting up every single recorded track plus their musical score uh, online for you to download. But there is this culture growing of people sharing their music, sharing their work, and allowing other people to, um, uh, to build on it and remix it. So I just wanted to show what this culture was doing and explain why people are doing it and uh, how it works. And it's extended to everything, so even paintings on your wall have to be uh, not copyrighted. I didn't, I didn't burn, all of my, uh, <laughs> burn all of my possessions when I started the, the project. The idea is to look at each particular area and then um, uh, try and find a way, see if there's anything happening in the open source kind of uh, movement and the open knowledge movement, and do a project in that area or try and highlight that area. Um, and uh, if there isn't, then try to develop something or try to work out how it could possibly work in the future. Sure. Thank you. It's very interesting. We might have time for just one short final question, if there is one. No? Okay, thank you very much, Sam. <laughs>